and we are live with Jimmy Song for episode 26 of the Wake Up Podcast. And this is the fifth and final installment for um, the Bitcoin time series for at least for edition three before I go and interview everyone else from the last edition. <laughs> so we're going to be talking about the moral case for Bitcoin and we're probably going to be talking about all sorts of other things. So Jimmy, thanks again for joining me. We only spoke a couple months ago, so I appreciate you not palming me off after nagging your ass so many times, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I enjoy this show and I enjoy uh, talking to you. So it, it's it's no burden at all. Uh, I enjoy putting it. that into the Bitcoin Times. I thought it was uh, it, it was great how, how it was included and with such luminaries. So um, I feel privileged to have been a part of it. And um, yeah, glad to talk about the moral case for Bitcoin because that's coming that's that's a big part of uh you know how bitcoin is thought of these days dude it's 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 funny because i think when you wrote it uh in in the introduction you you sort of said it's not something that gets discussed a lot but i think that sort of had its zeitgeist moment particularly over the last year um mm -hmm. i don't know if you agree with uh i did a tweet a couple i think it was like a week ago i, I can't i'll tell you what is really crazy like that we're only 15 years in, sorry 15 days into this year like it just feels uh -huh. so much longer and uh, like the tweet <laughs> that i wrote last week and it honestly feels like i wrote this months ago was 2020 like f sorry i wrote five years ago it seemed like things were getting dumber by you know maybe the year like mm -hmm. in 2020 things were getting dumber by the month or by the week like uh -huh. this year feels like it's getting dumber by the hour like, I, <laughs> I'm I'm watching the world and I'm like, are we in a show? Like, <laughs> where's the where's the stop button? <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, when our, when your money is hyperinflating, um, you know, may, maybe like things just get stupid much quicker. Um, I, like the the stupidity of everything else is also hyperinflating. I don't know. It it really feels like it almost feels like. Um, so much is happening like th there's got to be like for me i feel like there's got to be a crescendo at some point here um mm -hmm. and i don't know where that crescendo is but it just it feels like so much is going on and like almost i don't know if i would say time's compressing but it's like mm -hmm. uh, events maybe are compressing but time seems mm -hmm. to like be elongating or, or something it's just just it feels genuinely <laughs> distorted um uh -huh. And, yeah, and, yeah. And I, 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 I would say that's, uh, I don't know, what, what's the saying in poker? Uh, it's hours of boredom and seconds of terror. Um, that That's mm, kind of mm. the, we're, we're in the seconds of terror, right? Like there mm. are weeks when decades happen and decades when weeks happen, you know, like just this is this is the week where decades happen, uh, that, that sort of thing. So yeah, I, it does feel like a lot more things are going down, and uh, and you know people are making plays, man. Uh, that that's uh, definitely what it feels like. Um, yeah, I, to to a degree, I, I would suspect that uh, a lot of it is planned uh, in advance, and you know it's uh, people taking opportunities, and we could talk about sort of the Nietzschean et ethic that sort of uh, leads people to do stuff like that, but that that's uh, definitely where we seem to be at the moment. Well, well let, let's dig into that point then. Let's let's talk mm -hmm. about the, you know, the Nietzschean, I, I, I assume you're referring to the, like, the idea of like the will to power, right? Yeah. Okay, let, let's dig into that a little bit. Um, talk, talk me through how what's happening now and particularly what's happened last year is sort of a manifestation of that. Yeah, I, I, I touched upon it a little bit in the article, but basically every government is getting to be uh, more and more Nietzschean. Uh, and uh, that's uh, in, in the article, I called it positivist. And that's just sort of mm -hmm. like a, a, a way of viewing law and uh, what's moral and immoral. Um, from uh, the the thing that people seem to have some uh, somewhat like almost just sort of accepted without much resistance at all in the past year is that the government has the right to tell us what to do um and without any sort of uh resistance whatsoever it's uh you know they've given justifications for it obviously that they're uh you know keeping you safe or they're they're keeping grandma safe or they're keeping bureaucrats safe. I, I don't know i said so they're keeping something safe right um uh, that is enough justification for us to 
give them give away all kinds of power, including our right to liberty. Um, and in some cases, our right to, you know, run a business or assemble or I mean, there, there's just so many things that are have essentially been taken away from us, because they kind of can. And, uh, and in the past, uh, under a sort of different moral system, uh, where where people actually like believed in natural law and things like that, this is not something that they would have ever entertained. Uh, but because they, they don't believe in natural law, it seems, um, they have no qualms about, you know, adding restrictions like this. Um, and sort of wreck, uh, they're not even realizing how um, evil <laughs> these things are. It, 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 it's literally mm-hmm. like, th- this is what we condemn the Nazis for the, you know, Stalinist <laughs> yeah. Russia yeah. for and all, all of this. But, you know, pe- people seem to sort of be lying down and saying, okay, well, thank you for keeping me safe instead of, you know, uh, where, where are my rights? Uh, <laughs> don't, I, don't I have rights to my own stuff? And yeah, it, it's uh, that that seems to be what's happened over the last year as this power has been very much crystallized into things that into realms that we didn't expect, uh, especially personal liberty. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a wild thing. I want, I want to pull on a couple of threads there. So at, at some point, I want to discuss like the difference between natural and positivism. But there's um, a couple of threads I want to pull on. So you, you mentioned, um, you know, without resistance. And, and I guess mm-hmm. I would resist that a little bit in the sense that I think uh-huh. there has been there has been resistance but what what's really interesting and and this reminds me of you know all of those regimes that you mentioned whether it was the Stalin mm-hmm. or still the Nazis and all that sort of stuff is resistance has been labeled as um you know uh terrorism or conspiracy extremism so, so, so now, yeah extremism exactly so, <laughs> so so that's been labeled as that and the other part that I think is really dangerous and what's really concerned me is whilst, you know, governments are, you know, governments or central planners or bureaucrats and the intelligentsia, the academia, whatever you want to call all of these, you know, intellectuals would intellectual yet idiots, um, mm-hmm. you know, whilst a lot of them are to blame, I'm actually quite disappointed. And, and I wrote this in my uh, introduction on, um, on the Bitcoin Times is the the almost sadomasochistic nature of our fellow neighbors who are Mm -hmm. so inclined to support not only the deterioration of their own liberties uh, Mm -hmm. by some central institution, but to then also snitch on their neighbors and (laughs) want to willfully fuck up someone else's life. So, so, So for me, it's like, you know, all the, all the people who are willing to think, for themselves are now extremists and terrorists. Um, mm-hmm. And everyone who wants to be a part of a homogenous sludge has become, you know, uh, almost an enemy to, to the rest of us. Like they're, they're, they're a, as Hopper would sort of say, they're like a, um, they're almost an arm of this parasite called government. So like, mm-hmm. w- w- what's like, what's your thoughts on that? And A and B, do you think, um, you know, that's sort of the new face of modern warfare in a sense. Um, yeah, I, it, it is interesting that we're, we're seeing this phenomenon of, uh, of a lot of people that are essentially supporting um, these, you know, uh, sort of, uh, you know, violations of rights. Uh, I, I, you, would, you would think that they would be better understanding of what rights are and instead they're like snitching on their neighbors for having uh, you know a gathering of six people and and things like that which is kind of ridiculous uh, but in a sense it's we we've been kind of bred for that uh for the lack of a better word right like we're, we're put mm-hmm. in school for you know 12 years at least uh, and this is what we learn is obedience to authority without really thinking for yourself what the actual right thing is. We, we haven't really been taught right and wrong in, in sort of that natural rights framework. We've been taught right and wrong from a positivist uh, framework, which is, you know, if you're doing what the teacher says, then you're in the mm-hmm. right, no matter what it is that the teacher says, tells you to do. And you're, and if you don't do what the teacher says, you're in the wrong, no matter what the teacher told you not to do, right? Like it's, 
Um, and that that's sort of the mentality that we've all gotten into. And unfortunately, that's that's a mentality that's very hard to get out of because it, it's a very utilitarian morality uh, in the sense that if you do cooperate uh, with authority, um, I mean, things will generally go pretty well for you. If you're cooperating, you know, like they'll make sure that, uh, you know, you, you, you can sort of like stay to yourself. And as long as you give them what they want, they'll kind of leave you alone. Um, although, you know, like you're not allowed to do whatever they do, mm, tell you, you yeah. can't do. Uh, yeah. but, but that, that it's, it's sort of like the, um, the tendency to sort of like, you know, just get along um, and no matter what beliefs you have to give or no matter who you have to trample on it's uh, as long as I have peace safety and security then you know who cares kind of thing um, and it's a it's a very sort of uh, narcissistic kind of way of looking at things um, because it's it, it it really just is about self-preservation and much less about something greater uh, that's outside yourself, which is, you know, rights of other people, rights of, uh, you know, just principles of civilization and, um, you know, like wanting to do something greater than yourself. A lot of people have the sort of that existential um, angst uh, about them because they've been narcissistic so, so long and they don't know why they, their life feels meaningless. Well, it's, it's because, you've you've just been obeying whoever uh you know whatever they're saying and you know i mean of course you're going to feel depressed because you're not achieving anything that's beyond yourself and um and that that seems to be like what's happening there is that uh in a sense like that that whole snitching phenomenon of uh of like reporting on your neighbors and wanting everyone else to be as miserable as you it's um you know, it's it's part of that angst of uh, of not having purpose and uh, you know just seeing things as uh, see seeing the world in a pretty nihilistic dark way uh, and that that seems to have more or less pervaded the world <laughs> as far as I could tell and if you don't have Bitcoin oh man is is the world so depressing right now. Yeah, I, I think the, the the nihilistic thing I definitely agree with. It's because yeah, you know, we we've 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 traded meaning and purpose for some uh, some fleeting pursuit of happiness. I think and or and or safety we, even. It's not even happiness. It's, it's just yeah, yeah, don't yeah, exactly. kill it's me. Even, and yeah, that. <laughs> yeah. it's even more pathetic. You're a hundred percent right. It's even yeah. more pathetic than um than. And, 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 you know, it's not even, it's not even safety. We can even probably say it's just the illusion of safety. Yeah. That, yeah that's yeah. literally all it is. It's, um, mm -hmm. it's this, uh, pe people, uh, settling with the, um, with the, with, with the cage so that they mm -hmm. have the illusion of safety. Um, so mm -hmm. that, you know, so that someone doesn't hurt them supposedly. And, and I, I would, I agree with everything you said. I would just push back. Like, I don't even think it's even utilitarian because I don't mm. think um, this actually works. Um, I, I mm. think actually as this, th this pathway just becomes a, a de evolution um, until mm -hmm. it reaches some sort of breaking point where the, um, you know, as, as the, you know, call it the snitches and the uh, <laughs> and the unhappy and the and the jealous and the yes and all of that as they proliferate and effectively infect others. Um, what ends up happening is they they divide each other, and when they've eaten up or you know when they've disposed of individuals who who don't want to be a part of that. They don't have anything else to eat up, so they turn in on themselves, and you know the organism eats itself. So it's like a, it's like a parasite that ends up killing the host. It kills itself. Um, so, so yeah, like, yeah, I, and I I would agree with that. Um, uh, I I think if you have um, sort of a wide enough view, then you can clearly see that's coming. Like I mean, mm, there's mm. there's no way 
sort of the powers that be are going to stay united in whatever you know latest slogan there is there's going to be fights up there and somebody's going to take control and um, it'll marginalize more and more people and so on uh, but from a narcissistic point of view one one that is only focused on yourself it's yeah, hard to see that right because it's a it's a very narrow point of view because it's really only about your own safety so when you see your neighbor, um, you know, not wearing a mask or something like that, um, you know, you report them or whatever, uh, in, in a sense, because you don't really care about their, you know, rights or whatever. It's all about your safety. And if you're not, uh, you know, if you like, it gives you some something of a sense of purpose to snitch on them because you're at least doing something to prolong your purpose which currently is really just surviving um and like having some measure of uh of control over your life which you clearly don't because you know the government tells you what what to do so um in a sense it's uh, like from a psychological standpoint that seems to me the the main mechanic that's happening is that yeah i mean people don't have much purpose beyond their life right now and so they ascribe an importance to sort of physically living on uh to a degree that is just completely unhealthy and it brings on this existential angst and uh makes you sort of uh you know be kind of a terrible person to be honest mm -hmm. one thing actually so i I've, I've got a friend uh who's in germany and you know her and I, we sort of didn't really see eye to eye uh, on a lot of things, particularly the whole lockdown thing in the beginning. But it's really interesting to see how even she is now like talking about how depressing it is over there. You know, every, everyone is like, it's cold, it's dark. You know, no one is like, everyone's lost um, any sense of connection with other human beings, all for this. Um, for this, you know, again, illusion of safety that, you know, that the government tells us about, but also the short sightedness. I, I think that's probably another thing that's happened in the world today is, and this is also a function of, uh, I guess, fiatism, uh, whether fiat authority, fiat money, fiat, you know, uh, mm -hmm. dictates or whatever is um, it's shortened the, the time horizon of human beings. And, and that, Hopper actually talks about this in Democracy, the God that failed is um, he, he sort of discusses how monarchies are better than, um, than, you know, modern day democracies, because in a monarchy, you know, there's, there's at least some skin in the game from the monarch, you know, private property rights, you know, uh, you know, are resembled um, or embodied in some sense. Now, doesn't mean that monarchs are, are, are good, but they're a step up from democracy, because in democracy, what you've got is a caretaker with no skin in the game who comes in for a short period of time. Um, and what's their incentive mechanism? It's to, you know, to, to benefit now with, whilst having, whilst owning the, uh, the monopoly on morality, ethics, money, and violence. Um, mm -hmm. So you have no recourse to your uh, bad judgments or bad decisions. Um, and, who gives a fuck what's going to happen later? You know, the next person can deal with it because it's not my private property. It's public. Um, and that, you know, when we've shortened the, the time frame and we've, you know, created a moral hazard by removing any consequence of bad decisions at the top, that seems to have filtered through all of society now in a sense that everything is so short term. No one really gives a fuck. You know, we're, we're just thinking about the next paycheck the next bit of bread, you know, the next breath we can take. Um, and, and it's, it's weird. It's, it's, it's almost depressing. Like for, for, for someone like me, who's so uh, freedom oriented and mm. curious about life, I just, I walk down the street and I just see, you know, young people, healthy people just wearing masks in the middle of the day, walking on the mm. fucking street outside. It's just, I just don't feel a part of it anymore. And it's, it's just, I don't know, it's sad.
Yeah, I, I, I think what you're describing is sort of like a profound disconnection with civilization or society. And, uh, mm. and you know, physical presence uh, is one of the requirements of, uh, of having that. And, uh, and the unfortunate reality is that we haven't been able to be in the physical presence of too many other people. Um, and you could kind of see that whenever you actually go and hang out with people, people just hang out just a little longer because they missed it. There's something mm. like just it, like very human about connecting with people that's uh, that's entirely necessary. Um, the unfortunate reality, of course, is that a lot of people um, are really scared and they, they've given into their fear. And, uh, and I, I, I've said this before, the biggest thing missing, uh, the, the biggest thing that this uh, this whole crisis revealed is just a, a complete lack of courage on the on the part mm. of just people in society today because they are just utterly fearful of getting this thing um or, or what i really suspect is that they're they're more fearful of running afoul of government more than anything yeah. else or yeah. like social disapproval uh than actual like covid right like it it's it's more about like getting uh the approval of uh, of their peers or whatever uh, like it, it's, it's hilarious. Cause I, I, I'm pretty sure most of them don't actually think they'll like die or whatever, but they have to act like they do in order to get there. Dude, approval. it's a hundred percent that last one. So that same girl that I was just mentioning earlier. So she's uh -huh. like, I don't care if I get COVID. She goes, it doesn't matter. But she said, I just don't want to, um, be looked at when I'm on the bus or on the train, you know, like I'm tired of people, you know, looking at me funny and stuff. So it's literally become that it's literally. Yeah people don't want to be stared at like so they just want to mm -hmm. just fit in you know don't don't look at me don't disturb me and because it's funny because i got into a you know an argument with some crazy lady in a freaking chocolate shop in berlin and it was just it was just <laughs> so unnecessary well, i'm standing there next to her and you know they obviously wouldn't let us in with, in the shop without a mask so i had a mask on but i just had it sitting under my nose because i uh -huh. just hate breathing in that uh -huh. shit uh -huh. and she's standing next to me she like freaks out she's like Ugh! and i was like what uh -huh. the fuck? Uh -huh. And um, and then instead of speaking to me, she speaks to me through the um, through the chick at the cash register, uh -huh. and tells her to tell me to put my mask on. <laughs> <laughs> what the yeah. fuck? And yeah. I was like, look, I don't want to wear it. You know, you've got your mask on. I find it difficult to breathe. And then she fucking laughed, and I almost snapped. Like I like uh -huh. I wouldn't hit a woman, but I just I was like seeing blood. So I just walked uh -huh. out of the shop. And then this girl sort of that I was with, um, she mm -hmm. came outside. She's like, oh, why would you chuck, chuck a tantrum like that as a kid and all this sort of stuff? Uh -huh. And initially I felt bad. But then afterwards I thought about it and I thought, you know what? More people need to actually chuck a tantrum about this uh -huh. to start uh -huh. making it socially acceptable to uh -huh. actually resist. Because the more of us that just cower behind uh -huh. that, the more of us that just agree and be like oh yeah yeah and, and even if we justify it with oh you know i just you know i don't want to make it difficult for someone but fuck that we need to like make it as difficult as possible for anyone enforcing it even if it's not their choice to enforce it um uh -huh. you know like whether security guards or anything i actually think we need to push back because otherwise we end up with um what, what was that uh i think he was a pastor or something uh that uh -huh. said that saying uh they came first they came for the jews uh, sorry yeah. first they came for the communists but i wasn't a communist so i didn't say anything uh -huh. and then they came for uh -huh. the jews blah blah, blah. and yeah. then they came for me and there was no one left to yeah. speak for me I, yeah I, I think that's what it is at this point right yeah yeah I, there, there's definitely something about that there's um there there's uh like you're you're essentially uh talking about appealing to their narcissism because the reason why she, uh, you know, she's freaking out is because she thinks she's in danger and she's really only caring about herself, right? Mm -hmm, doesn't care mm -hmm, about you, doesn't mm -hmm, care that, mm -hmm. you know, you find it difficult to breathe. For all she knows, you know, you could have like a difficult breathing condition. And if you don't do mm -hmm. that, you might die. But yep. uh, as far as she's concerned, she, she, uh, she's narcissistic. So she doesn't put herself in your position and try to understand where you're coming from. Instead, it is all about fear and, and she's sort of running on instinct, running on whatever uh, is sort of coming to mind right away. <laughs> Sorry, uh, allergies. So- Corona's uh, got you, man. 
<laughs> We're all so, gonna die. Uh, <laughs> that that narcissism is uh, is very sensitive to uh, you know any sort of uh, social approval, social uh, you know like where where your status is in relation to others and so on. Uh, so I, I think what you're saying essentially is that by sort of making a bigger deal of it uh, and putting giving some pushback on the other side, you you add cost to sort of mm -hmm. doing what's perceived as safe. Um, and mm -hmm. that might scramble their thing a little bit. Now, that could potentially backfire uh, by by them, uh, you know, doubling down on their current belief. Uh, but, you know, it might, at least for those people in the middle, it might also, it might make it uh, easier for them to, to sort of like go more with the flow. And, and, and I've seen yeah. this, right? Like you, you have a group and, uh, and uh, you know, one person takes off a mask and then another person mm -hmm. takes off a mask. And then next thing you know, it it's like, yeah. Yeah, it spreads. And then like, there's still people with the mask, but they feel a little more isolated than the people that are taking, taking yeah. it off. And yeah. that uh, there, there's definitely something about social approval. That's a big part of this, which is, uh, you know, they, they people are so hyper conscious of their status. And that only happens if you have a really narcissistic society. I, I you don't, uh, there aren't enough people that just sort of don't care and will do whatever they want. Uh, and th those are the, ironically, like th those are the people that actually end up setting the trend for everybody else. So, uh, you know, you need more of that, but that again, requires a lot of courage. Uh, and that's not something that's in too much abundance right now, uh, unfortunately. And, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, I think uh, I'll we'll tie up this section with just the note on the courage. I think, uh -huh. like we said before, you know, society, when it optimizes itself, and, and I, I wrote about this at length, actually, in my Bitcoin Times piece was, you know, you, you we have a choice to optimize society for safety or for freedom. And, you know, the I think, and this will tie into the next question I actually want to ask you, which is where we'll go down your rabbit hole. But I think when society optimizes itself for safety the cost is courage mm. uh you know when uh when um and, and and that's like we we are paying that cost now is that we we have cushioned society so much that the courage of the individual is gone and we wonder why no one's willing to stand up to to speak when there is like evident things happening to others like you know i saw a bloody uh, video the other day of some chick you know at the airport and she wasn't wearing a mask and she fucking got wrangled by this big fat security guard like you know for her safety she got mm -hmm. practically beaten up um thrown on the floor and then chucked out of the fucking airport and arrested like mm -hmm. like that kind of stuff it's just that's that's the price we're paying as a society and it's un unfortunate in a world of collectivism that, um, you know, it, good individuals have to pay that price as well mm -hmm. alongside the sludge. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's, uh, that's really sad, but I'll, I'll tie this into my first question. So, so I had a list of questions here that I wanted to dig into, mm -hmm. but I, I, I wanna start really high and back in time, which is, mm -hmm. can you answer the question uh, or you know, to the best of your ability, like why do governments as an institution exist? Like in your mind, why do you think it emerged? Well, um, it, it emerged to help coordinate various things. Um, I, I, I think I've, uh, uh, I, I've read various theories on what their purpose was, but uh, generally it's, it's some, some form of coordination or some cooperation um, and you centralized cooperation is a lot easier than decentralized uh, and, and it's uh, easier to make that happen so if you need to you know um, a, a typical one is uh, is war right like if you're defending against a bunch of marauders then you know uh, having one person sort of coordinate the defense is a lot easier than having multiple pockets uh, because then they can just sort of pick you off one by one. 
so that's part of it. Um, I, I suspect that there's also a sort, a sort of, uh, you know, a desire for justice, if you will. Um, you don't want people that are doing wrong things that are violating other people's rights to uh, sort of get away with it. And government uh, in that sense is sort of like the the people that can help bring justice, uh, which is, you know, compensating the victim or uh, punishing uh, or, yeah, essentially compensating the victim. I think that's what justice should be. It's unfortunately been sort of um, changed uh, to yeah, essentially converted. like instead of paying debt to the victim, it's almost always paying debt to the state in the form of your time or something like that. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But that that's uh, that's what I think government should be. Uh, it, it's it's you know somebody that sort of distributes justice and coordinates um, you know against external threats, something like that. Okay, so so that uh, I guess the the classic Ayn Randian view was like government should perform three functions. Uh, function mm -hmm. number one is defend from external. Function number mm -hmm. two is some sort of policing, so defend people from mm -hmm. beating each other up. Um, mm -hmm. And function number three was uh, courts. You know, other than that, uh -huh. get government out of everything. So, um, I guess, you know, what what do you think went wrong along the way? So, like, you know, mm -hmm. the, the original promise of government sounds like it was to basically facilitate those functions um, and. Mm -hmm. You know, and so, 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 first question is, what's the difference between government, you know, in its original incarnations, um, mm -hmm. and you know, what versus now, and then what do you think went awry along the way? Yeah, that's a great question. I, um, I mean, I, 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 I think the main thing that went wrong is that governments uh, sort of put themselves in authority instead of thinking that they were under authority. And the, the, that's a, an important concept in my mind uh, is mm. thinking that they are the authority, essentially sort of like they can play God with people or being under the authority of something else um, that could be, you know, natural law or God or something like that. Typically, it's always been God, right? Historically, um, you know, people, uh, you know, sovereigns that thought they were under um, sort of the authority of God, they, they tend to act better, right? They, they didn't slaughter all their people or whatever. Uh, the people that didn't think that, that thought that they were the authority, they, they were the ones that committed atrocities, the ones that sent people to concentration camps and gulags and whatnot. Um, that, that uh, I think is the main thing. And, you know, that started with the enlightenment, you know, you, you saw what happened with the French Revolution. And uh, eventually, like that led to Marx and communism and lots of other sort of things along the way, but essentially it's, uh, you know, it, it's these governments that instead of thinking of their role as establishing justice, which means that you believe in some law or natural law or some, some set of principles that's, uh, that's unchanging, that's above you um, versus, you know, like sort of thinking that they're below you and that you can you can define them to be whatever they want whatever you want and we're kind of seeing that a lot today right like it's uh you know i like i i didn't think of like social distancing as a, a, a as like a right uh, a year ago uh but but that's uh, that's sort of like something that's been imposed that that that's a value that uh that's been sort of handed down as something that we need to respect or something um and it, that that sort of thing is uh, is because government itself sees itself very differently than they used to, um, and seeing uh, itself as sort of you know uh, enforcing justice that already exists or being able to define justice, th those are very very different things, and they lead to extremely different outcomes. Um, right now, unfortunately, what we're seeing is that governments think that they can define justice for themselves. And that's what 
essentially is what positivism is uh, and saying, hey, we get to define what uh, what good means for you and therefore you mm -hmm. have to follow it uh, and you get all sorts of weirdness like you do now. I, I mean, I think most people know that something is just terribly wrong right now. Um, I don't know if they put point this out as the cause, but I think it is. Yeah. W would you agree with the statement? So the way I kind of try and explain the difference between lateral law and positivism to people is positivism, you know, ends up being uh, an arbitrary application of rights uh -huh. or um, uh -huh. laws uh, to, to, to <laughs> different groups at different times and all that sort of stuff. Whereas natural law um, is mm -hmm. this idea of uh, rules or laws or, you know, values that are maybe not values doesn't even sit in here but like i guess constraints call uh -huh. it, that apply to everyone everywhere all the time yeah yeah and that and that's much more intuitive to people that uh mm, that mm. that that should be the way it is um and it's positivism that is unintuitive for people and this is why we call you know um you know nazis evil and uh you know, the Stalinist evil, uh, I mean, from a positivist standpoint, you, you really can't object to either of those if you come from a positivist mindset, because by uh, like, because the government can define what is good or uh, good or right or whatever. Uh, if there's no higher law, some higher sense of right and wrong, then they get to define it and you can't and if you subscribe to that then you can't say okay well they murdered all these people therefore it's wrong well i mean if the government says murder is right then then there's there's no real like objection that you can throw up unless you appeal to something higher uh, but that requires you to accept that there is a higher law in which case you can uh you, you know uh, there's the possibility that the government can be wrong, in which case you would have a moral obligation to object to a government doing something wrong. Um, and the unfortunate reality is that, you know, most people have a positivist mindset, probably as a result of, uh, you know, some level of narcissism that exists, which is, you know, like not looking at the larger view, but just, you know, how can I survive or how can I live um, instead of thinking about what what's worth taking a bullet for, what's worth mm -hmm. dying for, what's worth, uh, you know, having a purpose for. Um, for many people, the answer is nothing. Uh, so uh, when you have nothing to live for, the only thing you can live for is yourself. And that's not narcissism in a nutshell. And it brings an existential angst and a, a profound depression, which not surprisingly, many people are in right now. Yeah, I, um, I, I would just for the, uh -huh. the atheists um, out there who might be triggered by the word higher, <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm going to I'm going to also sort of frame. Um, sorry, go, go, go. Well, I mean, but it, it has to be higher than government. If government is your ultimate authority, you end up in this place of not being able to object to Nazism sure. or Stalinism. Sure. Uh, so no, it has to be higher than government. And I mean, like you can argue, uh, it, like if you, if, if you, like it has to, it has to exist in order for you to be able to object. Otherwise, you're appealing to something that is lower than some uh, something like government then that doesn't make any sense then you have no no objection so like logically it it literally can't work yeah so so maybe maybe higher is the appropriate word um you uh -huh. know i i i would also you know add the, the meaning of um i guess the 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 bottom up approach versus uh -huh. like the the top down approach and you know uh -huh. i sort of think of this in my mind as the difference between um uh emergent hierarchies of competence versus mm -hmm. uh fiat hierarchies which are not mm -hmm. based on competence they're just based on arbitrary positivist type uh yeah, it's based on power uh, it's uh i can impose this on you and that's it yeah 
Yeah, just because, um, not not uh -huh. because it, uh, not because it's uh, competent, not because it's uh, functional, but because I'm here um, and you're mm -hmm. not, and and I think that like, you know, Jordan P Peterson talks about this in his um in his first chapter of of Twelve Rules, and and I really like this chapter, and everyone knows it as the lobster chapter, but you know the uh -huh. just just the the idea of how natural hierarchies emerge. Mm -hmm. in in nature all the time like our mm -hmm. like existence's ability to to function depends upon uh ordering things in importance right and mm -hmm. importance is defined by some form of hierarchy so so hierarchies mm -hmm. are perfectly natural um mm -hmm. and you know that they, they always emerge naturally now when hierarchies become corrupt what they what do they do they, they you know they fall apart they decay you know like they they're not built on a strong foundation anymore and i think you know this this notion of government that we've been led to believe is the way the world works is mm -hmm. literally uh, a fiat hierarchy it's mm -hmm. literally no longer about competence it's no longer about are you good at what you do it's Mm -hmm. what position are you in um and uh -huh. you know the, like i mean you know that they they throw the word science around as if they're fucking scientists and they know <laughs> shit but it's like yeah it's it's completely blind and i think that that emergent property of natural hierarchies is really important because again that emergent property is bounded by the 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 uh ruling that i mentioned before which is mm -hmm. that the rules apply to everyone everywhere every all the time so so there's mm -hmm. no exception um and, okay. and i think that that's really i, I don't know if you yeah yeah um, so i i think what you're describing is basically um the hierarchy representing something else right like competence or functionality or I don't know, even even family relationships or something like that. It mm -hmm. uh, it, it it maps to something else, um, and yeah. the, uh, and I like the word fiat uh, that you're dis uh, using to describe it because um, uh, one uh, one way of describing fiat that I I, uh, I recently came up on, which I really like, is uh, is this idea that fiat is supposed to be a representation of something but it actually is not it, it ends up just representing itself so fiat money for example used to represent gold some a certain amount of gold uh but at a certain point it no longer represented gold it just represented itself and when you represent itself when it has no mapping to anything else um it's it, it's sort of unbound by anything and it tends to go kind of haywire um there there's no sort of grounding in reality if you will and i think that's uh that's the hierarchy that you're describing with government is that it's supposed to map to something right whether it be meritocracy or even uh hereditary rule or something right like uh, so some map it, it, it should map to something right now it doesn't really map to anything maybe popular opinion but i mean given sort of like the election shenanigans that that have gone on it's <laughs> it doesn't even really map to that so there yeah. it, it, it's literally fiat rule it's it, it's a hierarchy that is that that doesn't map to anything it doesn't uh it, it doesn't represent anything other than itself uh, it, it doesn't represent meritocracy or skill or competence or functionality or anything it's just it is what it is. It's just power. And, you know, you, you get that in uh, various uh, totalitarian places, right? Like what, what is, uh, you know, North Korea right now, right? It's, it's just, it's not the most, you know, able ruler that's ruling. It's not the most, the smartest guy ruling. It, it doesn't map to anything. It's just, he just happened to be the grandson of the guy that founded the country. That's it. And, and it, it, it sort of like unmoors itself from reality. And that, that, mm -hmm. that's where we kind of are at the moment is that, you know, we're, we're in a civilization that, uh, that's very fiat. It, it's, it's not based in reality. And you, you can unmoor yourself from reality only for so long before reality catches up. And then catches everything yeah, kind, yeah. kind of comes crashing back down, which is what happens with fiat currency all the time. Um, but fiat government, you know, I mean, uh, I, I can see the same thing happening. Um, there's a reason why Soviet Union fell and, 
you know, um, a lot of these uh, governments don't last all that long because once you get on more from reality, it's done. It's over. I love that point. Actually, I was on uh, a call the other day, and and that that actually question came up. It was like, so so what what can governments do to you know suppress Bitcoin? And I said that they can try everything. You know, they can mm-hmm. tr- like whether they're friendly towards Bitcoin or um or or non friendly towards Bitcoin. It doesn't actually matter because government is sort of abhorrent uh, when we map it back to reality really and and Mm -hmm. what what they're doing is they're playing games which like you said they they don't map to reality so that that, so they're you know they're using stephanie kelton economics two plus two equals 438 everything's made up you know there's Mm -hmm. like it doesn't map back to actual human time or human input or natural Mm -hmm. resources so it's like all this shit's made up And, and at some point like you know everyone bags capitalism these days because they don't know how to define it. Like, you know, when I look Mm -hmm. at capitalism, I I look at that as natural order, natural law. Capitalism is the, Mm -hmm. the, the most efficient use and application of the scarce resources we have, which is natural resources and our, our personal energy. So, so how best do we use that um, to, to produce something of use that, that is Mm -hmm. the forcing function of capitalism. And that has to be rooted in reality. Otherwise, you end up building shit, creating shit um, that doesn't matter. And you, you waste capital. You burn through capital. And that's effectively what's happening in, in the world today. Like you said, it's unmoored to reality. Yeah. So we're, we're, you know, they're, they're playing this game that at some stage, the, the, real, the gravity of reality is mm-hmm. going to catch up. It's like they're playing the game of Icarus. They're, they're yeah. flying. They think mm-hmm. they're geniuses. Um, mm-hmm. And just because on a short enough time frame, they've gone up for a moment, doesn't uh-huh. mean that gravity is not going to come and catch up. It, it will always catch up. And this is... And, and this, this uh, is why we call it sort of natural law, right? Like there, mm-hmm. there is a reality. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. uh, and, you know, there, there's sort of like a gravity to it or, you know, you know, mass and velocity and preservation of energy or whatever. It's sort of like the sort of metaphysical uh, equivalents of those that if if you're not connected to those, then it inevitably crumbles. It's like building a building that, you know, only or building a chair with only two legs or something like that. It's going mm, to fall mm. because it, it's it, it doesn't make any sense. It's not solid. It's it, it's not in in line with natural law. And um and that, that's something that, uh, unfortunately, like a lot of people just don't subscribe to. It's almost like they're denying gravity in a way, um, but in sort of like a, uh, in, in the metaphysical realm, because it, there, there really are rights and things like that. You violate them enough. Well, I mean, things go really badly and you, you become, you know, like you end up committing atrocities or you, you do mm. things that... Uh, I, I mean, in, in a sense, I, I suppose the last year can be considered an, atro- uh, an atrocity too. Like there, it we we we've become so far from reality, and that distance between what real uh, what reality is and what is said to be reality by those in power, um, that's a cognitive dissonance that's very difficult to manage and. In a sense, um, you know, a lot of people are depressed as a result because they're not finding themselves in alignment with natural law, essentially. So, okay, I want to tie this now into. Um, hold on, let me let me just pull up my question so I know I'm asking the right piece here because I've got a little flow. Um, okay. So, why does um, actually, you know what, before I ask this question, um, so where do you think, let's say in the absence of Bitcoin, where do you think this path leads? Um, you know, the, the path that we're on now, this, this path dictated by fiat authority, dictated not by, you know, competence or functionality or by, you know, natural law, which applies to everyone, every, every time, all the time. Um, where does this pathway lead? 
Yeah, I mean, um, generally, what uh, what happens when you build something that uh, that goes against the laws of physics is that it crumbles, right? It, it falls yeah. down. It, it doesn't last. Um, I, I expect that for any anything that's sort of fiat, that's unmoored from reality, that's uh, trying to defy uh, natural law of gravity, if you will, um, it it doesn't work. Uh, so, I, I I like how it exactly crumbles or what points uh actually cause it to crumble i don't know um like there are many ways for a two-legged chair to fall i think uh or a one-legged <laughs> chair to fall um yeah there there's many ways in which that can happen so it's it's a matter of uh sort of observing and paying close attention uh but it literally could be almost anything because you're uh, like you know, it's kind of like asking, okay, you throw somebody up in the air, it, uh, like, in what way will they land and break and <laughs> break themselves and hurt themselves? I mean, yeah. if you're dropping them from a, you know, 20 story building, they're going to hurt themselves in some way, you just don't know exactly how whether or not they'll be crippled for life, or they'll die, or, you know, they'll be a veteran. We I, like, it's hard to predict, because it is sort of like a, a lot of variables that are going into it uh, be, because they're just sort of trying to violate too many laws at once. Yeah. See, see, my my biggest concerns are, um, I guess, like, again, in the absence of Bitcoin, even potentially with Bitcoin, there's like, because because the, the level of stupidity exhibited by the intelligentsia is like next level, right? So, mm -hmm. um, you know, my, my biggest concerns probably center around uh, you know, a technocratic type dystopia where, uh, you know, we, where what the information we can digest, the people we can communicate with, the things we can buy effectively are completely centrally controlled, um, mm -hmm. you know, which is basically the, the dream of the Soviets who were not technologically advanced enough to potentially uh, mm -hmm. implement something like that, which the Chinese arguably may be or may not be. I think that's uh, one option. Are, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, the other one is sort of like, uh, you know, the the unleashing of a uh, of another type of leviathan. Let's say, you know, this whole race to to develop an AI uh, mm -hmm. that is better than us or smarter than us, and in the process, we make ourselves uh, obsolete through our arrogance and ignorance. Mm -hmm. um, the other one is potentially the uh, the the nuclear version where we you know all drop a button and you know bomb mm -hmm. ourselves. I feel like that's probably the least likely because it feels like in the modern age the um, I'm sorry I'm going into some dark shit here, but um, the <laughs> you know in the modern age I feel like uh, overt uh, mm -hmm. bombing kind of is like not politically correct enough, so it's, oh. you know it's probably less likely. But then you've got like the, the, the possibility of like an EMP because everything mm -hmm. is so fragile today. Uh, like uh -huh. everything's sort of just in time and particularly with all the lockdowns recently, like everything's been stretched mm -hmm. even further. Like mm -hmm. one EMP in one place could wipe out, you know, the last remnant of, um, of civilization in, in quite a broad location. So. I guess, do you have any thoughts on, or, or I guess maybe the fifth one is, um, is uh, a complete economic collapse, which uh -huh. I think might probably be the best one out of all of them, because if it's, if it's an economic collapse, then, you know, we kind of uh, uh -huh. have a chance to reset uh, and rebuild. But with, with that sort of context, do you think any of those are likely whether with or without Bitcoin um, or, you know, do you think with Bitcoin, we sort of have a elegant way out? What, what's, what's your thoughts there? That's a yeah, that, that, that's a, it's asking me to sort of predict how the world will end, right? <laughs> it's like, yeah. what's the most likely? Um, I, 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 I honestly don't know um, what, uh, but I, I wouldn't sort of uh, sit on the nuclear question because I, things change so quickly, um, and th this is the mm. thing about sort of fiat morality, which which I think we're under right now. Is yeah. uh, you you know things change so quickly. What what used to be considered like sexist like five years ago is like now considered fine. I I I don't understand like 
the the rules keep changing because they're not more to mm-hmm. anything, right? They're not mm-hmm. uh, they're not hooked into whatever. So uh, it's entirely possible at some point if uh, if say Texas secedes or something, let's just say something like that happens, and then all of the uh, all of the people that are you know on the more conservative conservative side move in, all the liberal people move out, and then the you know the people that are in control of Washington, D.C., um, you know, feel that all the racists are in one place. Let's uh, and they they are disrupting our communications or something. Let's go bomb them. This is this is this is the right thing to do or something. I, I wouldn't put it past them to have mm-hmm. something like that happen. Right. Like it, it's not a a a, uh, a crazy scenario in my mind like uh, that you know, pretty much anything can be justified at this point. If you can lock everyone down and uh, essentially place everyone under house arrest for this long, um, you're capable of a lot more. Uh, and now, like that said, I, I think, uh, you know, there, there are enough people in government, at least at the moment, that, uh, you know, at least pretend that they have uh, some higher law that they subscribe to uh and at, at the very least have to um <coughs> sorry uh show that to their constituents uh that it it, it will be okay uh like I, I don't think that's like imminent or anything but is that possible in the future absolutely because what once you're sort of uh f- quote unquote free from moral constraints you you're capable of anything uh and we've seen this in the 20th century it's it's just a matter of uh justifying it and manipulating uh people and civilization or society around you to uh go along with whatever it is uh, your reasoning or moral reasoning might be and then go from there um and th- that's the playbook of any government nowadays to justify whatever it is that they do whether it be war or uh you know bailing out banks or whatever it, it, it's uh you know pow- uh, uh and this is what i mean by like sort of that nietzschean morality it's uh you know the underneath the surface it's all about will to power if i can do it i i i I will and it's moral for that reason but at least it's sold that but in a way it's it's sold to the public as the moral thing to do because they control the narrative and they can um you know like they got a lot of minions and you know academia and the media and hollywood that that will go along with it and uh and make it costly from sort of a social standing perspective to go against them and that's that's what we've seen in the last year so that to me is the is the vector by which uh things start to crumble uh and we're, we're kind of already seeing it a little bit um like the insane amount of money printing that that has economic consequences they're going to try to forestall it as long as they can but Given the existence of Bitcoin, it's not going to be easy to forestall it for all that long. Because as soon as people come in to Bitcoin, uh, mm-hmm. in any kind of numbers, um, that that's we go from gradually to suddenly real quick, and then you can see the disintegration of government or like a a, a huge scaling back because the bureaucrats aren't going to get paid. The deep state ain't gonna get paid. All all of those people are, you know, now. I mean, they they either have to become thugs, which I really hope they don't, but it is possible that they become sort of like the new SS or something and demand, uh, you know, your property uh, just to you know keep them in power. But I mean, my gut feeling is that they probably aren't because they're bureaucrats. Uh, they they just don't like doing much at all so um they'll yeah. probably complain and that's it we'll we'll see what happens though but that that seems to me the most likely scenario uh that that's about to happen it's, it's interesting how yeah. you know bitcoin's in a sense become a an accelerant uh mm-hmm. in many ways for this because um you know I, I always say like when i when i try and get people uh, into and interested in Bitcoin, you know, I always talk about how 
the cornerstone of, of freedom is free human action. Like, and I always use the example of, you know, don't tell me what someone says. Like, if I want to know someone, I don't want to know what they say. Show me their bank account and I'll tell you what they believe. Because, you know, that, that, that you know, their bank account, where they spend their money, what they do is, is, is basically who they are. That's their human action uh, in economic form. And, and when an authority can have the, the, the power to determine your human action, you are fundamentally a serf. You're, you're all, not even a serf, you're a fucking slave. And, and, and that's why I say, like, for me, Bitcoin is the most important manifestation of freedom of speech and freedom of the individual. Like, the, it, it mm. actually starts there uh, beyond anything else. Um, and then from there, we can sort of build. So I guess... Without me um, going any deeper on that, um, we talked about this doomsday. So mm-hmm. I want to ask two questions in in wrapping this up. Is you know what is a the moral case for Bitcoin, and mm-hmm. I want if you can lead that into how uh, Bitcoin. We know it's an accelerant for for the for the collapse mm-hmm. of the the fiat authority we're living in, but what does you know what what a what might be some alternatives to those bad uh, events or bad versions of the future that Bitcoin might help uh, enable? So what's the moral case for Bitcoin and what what can Bitcoin do to fix or change some of these potentially bad destinies? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, the moral case for Bitcoin is that it's in alignment with natural law. So it... It, it it's uh it obeys the physics of natural law or something like that and uh it, instead of you know money being sort of handed to whoever uh happens to be the money printer uh instead of uh you know a third party that can restrict your transactions or censor your transactions or confiscate your money or whatever you you have market participants that can freely transact on their own uh, that is a very different system than what we have currently. Uh, one that is very positivist. It, it serves those that are in power uh, and lets them do whatever it is that they want to do uh, without any regard to natural law. So Bitcoin is in alignment with natural law. And, that, and for that reason, um, and if you believe in natural law, believe that these rights exist and that it, there's a... There's sort of like uh, uh, an ideal there uh, that if we subscribe to that we much, uh, you know, human society and civilization thrive and so on, um, then that's the reason why, you know, it, it fixes a lot of things because it's it's anchored in natural law. It's anchored in reality. It's an anchored in, uh, you know, the physics of the metaphysical, if that makes sense. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, it, if it is, then everything else can sort of anchor to it as well. It, it's uh, what uh, what investors would call like we we have uh, a yardstick that stays static instead of one that's fluctuating and uh, and things like that. That that makes it easier to build things, um, and that makes it easier to create things, uh, including a more just government. Um, now, government happens to be uh, the entity that's most associated with money printing and so on, uh, but you know that they're they're not the only ones. There's uh, banks and all these other um, entities that take advantage and essentially cause a lot of the you know injustice that's in the world right now. So. Um, you know, Bitcoin fixes a, a lot of things because it's it's just you know more in line with what is reality. Uh, at least that's that's my view. Is you know moral uh, or natural law is a part of metaphysical reality that if you don't um, you know like sort of give it its due uh, uh, respect that. Every, you know, everything else will just sort of fall apart on its own. So as a result, it's much better to build on. So what, what's, what's some of the, for, for someone who's, you know, not as far down the Bitcoin rabbit hole as us, um, mm-hmm. what, what are some of the elements uh, about Bitcoin 
that make it more in line with natural law? Yeah, uh, so it's it, it doesn't have any sort of subjective. Um, it, it's not so subjective, right? Like there's uh, uh, anything with the central bank is very much subjective uh, because they can, you know, print more money or whatever. Um, it's also not physical, and believe it or not, that's that's a that's a good property for money and it's closer to what money should be um it because money represents something in the metaphysical realm it's the amount of value you've provided somebody else if it's tied to a physical item then it's uh it's less sort of it 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 represents it less, if that makes sense. It, it it's yeah. not as pure of as pure of a representation. It makes it harder to transfer it. For example, uh, if you want to use the value that you've already earned to go pay for something else um, with something physical, now you have to transport it, and that's sort of a tax on what money actually should be. So uh, by by removing that, uh, it, it's it's closer to what money is in reality in sort of like that metaphysical reality sense, um, it, yeah. it's 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 real value and it represents it, it maps a lot closer than some something like gold does if that makes sense uh, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. you know there there's this idea of value that we provided and it, it if you map it to bitcoin it's a lot closer to what it should be than if you map it to gold or something else um mm -hmm. And and that that's a wonderful thing, um, and that that means that we uh, the rest of the economics of uh, labor and you know where you're providing value and trying to figure out um, you know how you can provide value to others th those things map better as well, um, and ultimately that builds up civilization um, yeah, that so that causes more trade and so on. Yeah. The, the way I, like, I usually like to think of it, um, if you agree with this, is kind of, I, I consider money as almost like a fabric that permeates mm -hmm. through society and, and it kind of enables uh, mm -hmm. communication, the, the, the communication of human action, basically, between individuals uh, all throughout mm -hmm. society. So, so you can't have, I always say this to people, it's like the form of money can change, but you can't mm -hmm. have civilization without money. Like it'll always mm -hmm. emerge. And, you know, mm -hmm. and if we go back to the beginning, it'll start as sticks and stones and, you know, whatever, but it'll always emerge as something. Mm -hmm. And this is sort of like the apex point. So mm -hmm. coming, c coming to the, the digital nature then. So what if I'm a naysayer and I say, well, mm -hmm. you know, government money's digital. So, so what, what's, what's different about Bitcoin and what makes it a better form of digital, you know, information in a sense that acts as money? Yeah, so there, there's sort of like the objective element of it. Well, there, there's the physical versus digital nature of it, but there's also mm -hmm. sort of like the objective subjective nature of it. Um, so uh, gold is very objective, right? <laughs> you, you know uh, whether or not you have a piece of gold or not. Um, fiat money is much more subjective because you can just sort of print it at any time. And that that's that's where this uh, this idea that, it's if it's centralized, it's naturally just going to have a lot more subjectivism into it, uh, or it, it's uh, the creation of it is subjective or arbitrary or in the service of uh, a few people instead of the entire community and so on. Uh, whereas something de decentralized is is more objective. It's it's you know you, you know exactly how much there is. Um, and you don't have to make judgments on value. It's it's not market. Instead of a third party making judgments on the value of something, it's uh, it's the direct participants that make the uh, that judgment, and that's how it should be. That's what money is supposed to be. If we're if you and I are trading, and uh, you know I give you a you know some amount of money for an apple, um, we more or less agree. Uh, agreed that the apple is more valuable to me than the money that I'm giving up. And you're agreeing that the, uh, that the apple is worth less to you than the money that you're giving up. That's, that's value additive to both of us. And that mm -hmm. um, there's no third party in between, but when you have a, say a government implementing price controls, right? Um, minimum wage, for example, it's saying, okay, well, 
we're going to add um, a subjective valuation, an arbitrary valuation uh, that makes it more difficult for you to do trade or to determine for yourself whether or not um, you know you're you're getting getting that value. So um, you know. It, even if it is digital, um, and it is kind of convenient to, um, you know, use the dollar, for example, to buy things, at least in the U.S., um, it's it, it still has that element of subjective valuation uh, of um, sort of like picking winners and losers, if you will, which is essentially what government does with every regulation. And the fact that they can print money for their own ends. Uh, and almost always the subject of valuation comes to government is more important than whatever your savings might be. Um, taking uh, that is a major flaw of the US dollar. Um, so two things, uh, you know, physical versus digital, obviously digital is superior, subjective versus objective, obviously objective is superior. Could we also throw in, because I remember when we first caught up actually in Sydney a couple of years ago, uh, mm. you gave a talk and you, uh, you're one of the first people I heard really nicely articulate the idea of, uh, uh, what was it, a decentralized digital scarcity? Was, was that what That's or right. was it? Digital mm -hmm. yeah. Well, yeah. Could you maybe touch on that as a big difference between uh, mm -hmm. fiat digital money and, you know, this Bitcoin digital money? Yeah. Yeah, so um, so Bitcoin is decentralized, digital, and scarce. Those are the three main properties that it has that nothing else has. So um, it's decentralized like gold, but it's digital like World of Warcraft gold, and uh, and scarce uh, in a way that nothing else has ever been scarce. Uh, even gold gets additional uh, gold coming in. We know that Bitcoin will never go above 21 million units. Uh, so it's digital, decentralized, and scarce. Um, so the digital aspect sort of gives it a convenience and it, it, uh, it maps uh, to what money is supposed to be, which is value you provided mm -hmm. to somebody else a lot better. Um, it's it, it's decentralized, so it's it doesn't have sort of like the subjective uh, value judgments of somebody else interfering with your trade, um, and it's scarce so that it stores value over time um, instead of being diluted uh, in some way. Um, like gold is uh, is objective, but you know um, a, an asteroid can hit the earth tomorrow that's got a lot of gold in which case uh gold would be instantly devalued almost uh so Ooh, although that like might there... be the last of our least of our problems if the asteroid is. <laughs> well it depends on the size of it right like uh who knows <laughs> Uh, so there there's there's a uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of different things um that Bitcoin makes superior and it, it's closer. Um, and, and really, this is the argument, uh, an almost moral argument for Bitcoin, is that it's closer to what money's supposed to be and it aligns with natural law. And if it aligns with natural law, it's just going to function better. Uh, now, you can, as a Christian, I believe that that was God's design for what money is supposed to be. Uh, but if you're an atheist and you believe in natural law, that these, these, uh, you know, rights exist and that uh, if we function that way that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll all get along better and we'll build civilization. I mean, it, it functionally from a practical standpoint ends up being the same thing, which is that yeah. it's, it's, it's just, it maps better to what, uh, you know, this, this uh, massive coordination uh, that happens sort of in a decentralized way that the free market is. And, uh, you know, like the less interference, the better and uh the more convenient the better and this this is what bitcoin enables so so noob question alert then so why why can't the government turn around and say oh we're gonna make our currency um scarce and we're gonna uh -huh. limit the supply so so what's what's the difference between that and and bitcoin's guarantee for scarcity how, how does bitcoin have a better guarantee for scarcity? yeah uh so yes. the government can change its mind right? uh, I, I read this essay uh, like just a little bit ago, and uh, 
it, it was uh, by Stefan Kinsella. Uh, he's a uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. really good libertarian uh, sort of law, uh, uh, sort of uh, thought leader IP or lawyer, something right? like that. Yeah. Uh, so his, his argument, uh, uh, and this is from an article like from 10 years ago, was that you know, decentralized law uh, is superior to legislated law. And uh, his argument was uh, decentralized law is essentially something like English common law, which uh, which happens through lots and lots of different judicial decisions about specific cases. Um, And as a result, you come up with sort of like this corpus of law uh, that's based on precedent. Okay, here here's what actually happened. And based on those, these are the decisions that can be made. Um, And generally decentralized law tends to be harder to change because you need a lot more, uh, you you need at least the equivalent amount of precedence before you can overturn something. So it it takes a while. Uh, Whereas legislation is uh, almost always temporary, right? Like you, you, you pass some law and then you pass another law to supersede that law. So it, it, it's a, it's a lot less permanent. Uh, And in that way, um, you know, when, if a government were to say we're going to make this dollar scarce, it's essentially like a piece of legislation. It's it, it's mm. it's very centralized and it can change at any time. If somebody new gets in power, that's no longer going to be the case. There's no way you can trust that going forward. Uh, whereas something decentralized, that's a lot easier to trust going forward, especially because you need enough sort of like network momentum in order to go the other way. And you'd see it from a mile away if it were going in that direction. Uh, So in a sense, decentralized things are much easier to trust uh, because of their, of the nature of how difficult it is to, uh, you know, like overturn all of that precedent. And that, uh, that I think would be the way I would describe uh, why, you know, Bitcoin is easier to trust than say what the Fed said last week. Yeah, so it's like a, the, the the promise coming from a central bank or a, or a government is just another fiat promise. Uh, uh-huh. It's just yeah, we'll 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 do it today, but not tomorrow. And um and I think I've always said that that's you know when they were coming up with libra i wrote a article called bitcoin blockchains and bullshit and uh-huh. basically put libra and the, the the potential future of cbdc's in the third category of bullshit because mm. they you know the the whole raison d'etre for bitcoin is this unchangeable constitution you know, which is the white paper, which is its core rules, 21 million, 10 minute blocks, uh, you know, halving every four years and, um, and the, what's it called the, um, the difficulty algorithm and and say another couple set of rules. And, and the beauty of Bitcoin is that it's vol it's completely voluntary nature. You know, Mm. if you want to be a part of it, you can, if you want to change it, you also can, um, except, you know, you'll be on uh, Bitcoin Jimmy's version. And, um, and, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe a portion of your Twitter followers will come with you <laughs> and, um, and that run that Bitcoin, but it's, but it's, it's, it, you know, it, it's going to fail to, to pick up the economic mass necessary for mm-hmm. a, uh, for, for a movement to occur. And, and that's mm-hmm. effectively, you know, Bitcoin I always, I love the dichotomy of Bitcoin's, uh, closedness or its security is found in its openness Mm. it's the fact that anybody can copy it so it doesn't actually fucking matter um Mm. what matters is the 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 consensus the the voluntary consensus of uh the participants who are part of that network and and that that voluntary nature i think is also what makes it very different to a centrally issued digital Mm. currency is that a centrally issued digital currency is again done by dictate or by decree, whereas Bitcoin isn't. It's like you 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 picked it up because you wanted to. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, and so, that that that's a lot easier to trust because you you don't have arbitrary third parties that come in and interfere with things. Um, and I, I've been reading um, some of Rothbard's Ethics of Liberty recently, and that, yeah. that's a point that he brings up over and over again is. Uh, when you when you have sort of like third party interference, uh, it, it it skews everything, um, including 
um, sort of, uh, you know, property rights and things like that. I mean, he, his, his view is that everything is a property, right? And when you're talking about freedom of speech, it really doesn't make sense without like some property on it. Where are you talking yeah. about it, right? Like it, if you own the land that you're standing on, you can say whatever you want, right? Like, um, and that, that makes sense. But if you're at, you know, some restaurant, you don't have the right to say whatever you want. That's a, that that or dress however you want or whatever because that that's part of it's somebody else's property. Um, and in that way, I, I think it's given me a new perspective on the importance of uh, of thinking about things in terms of property. Because in a sense, yes. like almost everything we own, uh, you know, quote unquote, own uh, in in society today is not really owned that there's there's always third party interference mm. like if you don't mm. pay your taxes on your house they'll take it away it, uh and apparently if you're uh if you own like a piece of property and have too many people there then that's a violation somehow because you don't really own it they 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 can enforce uh whatever restrictions uh they they want on your property um that uh, leads to sort of like a discounting of the, uh, of the real ownership. And I think that changes the price of it uh, because you don't quite have as many rights as, uh, as you would in a real, like if you really owned it and so on. Uh, but similar things are happening all over the place. It's, um, uh, you know, like the, the whole Twitter controversy of being deplatformed, it's, it's all muddled because you know, what do you have the prop? Like, do you have, mm -hmm. is your username on Twitter like your property or is it Twitter's? And like the people on one side are saying it's all Twitter's and therefore you have no right to complain. Other people are saying, well, no, it's actually yours because those are your tweets or whatever. And uh, like, it's, it's all muddled. And this is where like decentralization like clears absolutely everything up because if it's decentralized, then you know who owns it, and in in a sense, it's a it's a critical part of uh, of, of what gives clarity to a lot of things, and uh, and makes it a lot more efficient because there's a lot a lot more certainty and a lot less sort of subjective judgment. If that makes sense. Yeah, I, I think two two points there. One, I'll echo. Uh, Ethics of Liberty by Roth, but I would also recommend um, For a New Liberty. That that's a, it's a shorter book, but he just mm. really sums up his entire philosophy and and sort of property rights as the cornerstone of uh, existence and coexistence. Like we, mm. we cannot have anything without private property rights. Uh, mm. Like the, the, everything falls apart, and I think. Rothbard, I would personally argue Rothbard is like the most powerful philosopher of, I don't know, <laughs> last couple thousand years. I, like, I, I might so quibble with you a little bit there because uh, I, okay. I, I think he's a really good historian and uh, he, he does elucidate some things, but I think he was a little bit ignorant of a few things, uh, including, you know, his uh, interpretation of the regression theorem, which we're still like sort of having to fight with the Bitcoin cash people about. So, yeah. Interesting. Okay. Um, yeah. Let's let's save that one for a future one. So um, <laughs> I, I don't know enough about the regression theorem myself to, to be able okay. to actually comment. So okay. uh, so that um, the what was the other thing you mentioned there? Yeah. The 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 decentralized nature of existence is that mm. I I always argue that life is uh, or you know nature and everything that we see around us is something that emerges in a decentralized fashion. You know, there's no mm -hmm. there's no like central you know natural uh you know dude hanging around saying okay you lions mm -hmm. do that and the grass mm -hmm. has to grow this way and the trees it's uh -huh. like it, it happens in and of itself at the edge it doesn't happen from the center um mm -hmm. and and it, you know it sort of it finds its way and i think we sort of discussed this with the podcast that we did with with um with jordan uh, a couple months back but mm -hmm. it's you know w when you try and uh control that from the center, like you said, you know, via some sort mm -hmm. of third party, all that you do is you stifle the natural progression mm -hmm. uh, of existence. Like, because mm -hmm. it, it's impossible to to gather all that data, to to process it, and then to decide what to do. Because you know, you mm -hmm. you would actually have to pause time to do mm -hmm. that. 
um, mm. and then to, to, you know, to, to, to then try and emanate all of the information back out again radially. So it just, it just doesn't work. And it's just crazy to see the hubris of uh, society today and how we, um, how we try and like uh, discredit the, the decentralized nature of existence and, and the fact that human beings who are at the edge of doing stuff mm -hmm. uh, somehow no less than a couple of dictators in the center who believe that they know better for all of us. Um, yeah, I, the thing about centralization that I, I think the conclusion I've come to about centralization is that it really muddles up property rights. Uh, it's it's mm, difficult mm, to know mm, who owns mm. what because you uh, you essentially are sort of trusting the third party with your property in some way, shape, or form. And uh, it, you know uh, this is not a complete thought yet, but basically. Um, for example, government has like public roads or public parks or whatever. Who owns that, right? Like, it's not clear <laughs> who, who owns it because technically I'm a citizen and I pay my taxes. I own a piece of that or something, but I have to obey government authorities if they tell me I can't be there at a certain time. It's, it's not clear who owns it or, you know, whose property it is. And of course, like, uh, you know, those are the places that the homeless people go and set up tents because it's not mm -hmm. clear who owns it. If, if somebody actually owned it, then they can evict them off their property. But if it's public land or if, if, if there's some central, central uh, you know, force that sort of like where we entrust some of that, right? Like uh, we've entrusted them with our taxes and uh, some, some land uh, for their operations, uh, but it's not clear who owns it. It's it's not any particular citizen and, and so on. Uh, and similar things happen with money and uh, and lots of other things where, you know, you, wherever there's centralization, uh, property rights get really muddled. Uh, it's it's uh, like even money in your bank, it's not clear who owns the money. Like mm -hmm. they have custody of it, uh, but uh, you know, you, you have an account with them. So, you know, um, it's yours as long as you don't violate certain AML KYC laws or, you know, do something illegal or, you know, sell drugs or do child porn or whatever. It's, it's not clear at all. And, uh, and that or that's support WikiLeaks of, or now wear a mask <laughs> apparently. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that, that's the thing is, is that centralization uh, sort of muddles property rights and it makes a lot, it makes things just, really uncertain uh whereas like with decentralization you know exactly who owns what and at that point you know things are a lot more certain you don't have to you know satisfy a third party that's not party to the transaction in order to complete the transaction and that that's just a more efficient way to have a, and it's a literally a more free market because there's no restrictions uh based on sort of a uh, uh, partial ownership of the property right by a third party that really isn't party to the transaction or shouldn't be. So it, yeah, mm -hmm. it, it, that to me is, uh, is part of why things just get really muddled uh, and weird when, when you get to that. I would, I would love to do a podcast down the track on, um, on just discussing property rights, because I think that's mm -hmm. such a underappreciated element of it, it, it literally forms the cornerstone for Austrian economics, for libertarianism, for all this stuff. And I think one of Bitcoin's most powerful attributes is that it is uh, private property. It, it embodies private property rights better than anything else in the world. Because like mm -hmm. if, if property starts with you, um, mm -hmm. you know, the first step beyond you and you owning yourself as your own property is your thoughts. And mm -hmm because Bitcoin transforms money into information which can be stored in your thoughts. Mm -hmm. It's the, it's the almost the purest form of property other than you that exists. Mm -hmm. and, and that yeah. like, I think is why Bitcoin fixes mm -hmm. this. Like it, it you mm -hmm. know, it changes the dynamics. It, it's the, it's the, it's the keystone almost of all of the crap we're seeing. If we can reintroduce private property rights uh, at the level of money, which is like you sort of discussed earlier is, um, you know, this fabric that binds us, 
-hmm. we have a foundation upon which to do everything else. Um, and we don't have no idea, I think, what that looks like in the future because we've been so, you know, I guess we've almost been like a, a, a sprinter on a racetrack with our fucking shoelaces tied together and a bullet in our left ass cheek, you know, like mm -hmm. and we're trying to run down doing a hundred meter mm -hmm. sprint. Like it, it's all, like you said, it's completely muddled. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Bitcoin sort of unlocks so much potential just mm -hmm. through that shift in clarity around what, what property who's is, who's? is yeah. whose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, and I, I think I, I mentioned before that you know Bitcoin maps to the value we've provided to other people really well. It yeah. also maps mm. to this um, sort of metaphysical concept of property, um, like yeah. you know, like uh, it, it, the fact that I own this mug is is an abstract concept. It's a metaphysical concept, and uh, and you know, like mapping it. Um, like it can be stolen, it can be lost or whatever, but I still own it, even if it's lost, if that makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. Like it, it's still mm -hmm. kind of mine. Um, that doesn't map that well to the physical world, but in the metaphysical, it, it maps really well with Bitcoin uh, because it's metaphysical. It's, it, it, it doesn't have to be outside of myself. Um, it can't, and in that way, it's much more aligned with natural law um, and, again it's kind of like the physics of metaphysics it's uh it it it, it uh, it's the way it should be and it aligns much closer to that because it can't be sort of forcibly taken away from you it's unconfiscatable as they say and that yeah. um and and that's what property rights should be uh from from a natural law perspective no one should be able to take it away from you unfortunately with physical items it doesn't map that well because things can just sort of be taken away or confiscated because of its physical nature um but that mapping is an important part of what makes bitcoin that much more powerful uh for the purposes of trade for commerce for storing value and so on yeah, I might throw something in there. So I've I've toyed mm -hmm. with this whole property thing for, for mm -hmm. a while. And, you know, I was, um, I'd recommend people have a look at a book called um, uh, The Territorial Imperative by an anthropologist mm -hmm. from back in sort of the 60s, 70s. And I mentioned him, uh, Robert Audrey. Mm -hmm. He's absolutely brilliant. And and he he makes a case that, you know, territory is uh, biological. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm writing a piece now called... Uh, private property as a biological imperative. And I, and I mentioned this last time, it's, I, I don't think mm -hmm. that, uh, I think private property is purely a, a natural emergent thing. It's nature's way of uh, stabilizing and finding equilibrium. But mm -hmm. um, the, the, the property thing, I've, I've really done a lot of thinking around like, you know, property is almost, um, or private property, like is that which you can defend in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, and this is why physical objects are a little bit harder because in the physical realm, mm -hmm. um, that which you can defend, you know, re requires, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, level of protection. This is why the second amendment is so important in America and, mm -hmm. you know, why the founding fathers, you know, they sort of intuitively understood that is, you know, everyone needs the right to protect themselves. And, and mm -hmm. when everyone has the right to protect themselves, you create a, um, almost like a level of deterrence where you create mm -hmm. peace through the fact that, you know, people know if I break into mm -hmm. this guy's house, I'm going to, you know, bust, someone's mm -hmm. going to bust the cap in my ass. So, so, but, you know, physical objects are fundamentally harder to protect and therefore have almost weaker property rights. Whereas Bitcoin has stronger property rights because, um, you know, the cost to defend it is very low. Like it's, it's, you know, it's mm -hmm. memory in your own mm -hmm. brain or it's, taking a string uh, of characters and hiding it somewhere. And, and that is much easier to do than trying to like protect a, you know, a wheelbarrow or a room full of gold. Like good luck mm -hmm. trying to do that. You, you're going to need mm -hmm. more than just your memory to do that. So by changing the, um, the cost of lo lowering the cost of defense and increasing the cost of attack, um, mm -hmm. like for an attacker to take your Bitcoin, they really need to fucking, have their shit together they need to know where to find you like what what to do extract your brain somehow like it's just it changed and i that that change in dynamic i think sends us down a very different path than the world we live in today where not only are property rights 
uh, not, not only can property rights be violated by thy neighbor, but mm -hmm. property rights are now being violated by from the top, from the very mm -hmm. institutions who are supposed to, you know, protect our property rights. Mm -hmm. It's fucking crazy. Mm -hmm. So like Bitcoin, I think, changes that really, really fundamentally. Yeah. I, I, and it's it's the metaphysical nature of Bitcoin. It's it, it, it's mm -hmm. uh, it's a, it, it's in that realm. Um, and I, I would say personally, like beliefs are property rights, too. And they're mm -hmm. just as hard to take away. Right. Like uh, if you want me to believe something that I don't believe is true, um, good luck with that because that mm -hmm. that's internal to me and it's kind of like taking my bitcoin it's internal to me and um it or i can choose to make it that way uh such that mm -hmm. if you want if you want it out of me um then you're 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 going to have to make it voluntary it forces sort of like mm -hmm. a voluntary transaction instead of an involuntary one and that that's the ultimate defense is if if there, if the only way to get something from you is voluntarily, well, that's completely in line with natural law. It's so much easier to enforce yeah. natural law that way because, yeah. it, like, it, it's it's trying to literally convince me, right? Like, it, it's it's like a belief. If you want me to change it, then you better come, like, you better come and tell me like why it is or whatever. Um, I might even pretend that I agree with you just to get you off my back, right? Like, but but I I, I don't have to necessarily change it if I don't want to. Um, and many martyrs throughout history are, you know, like known for holding it on even in the face of death. This is this is what this goes back to what we were talking about. It's having a purpose beyond your life and having mm -hmm. uh, having something that you'd be willing to take a bullet for. Um, now, it, it doesn't have to be Bitcoin, but it's in that realm of stuff that you possess so strongly uh, that you could die with it if you wanted to. Um, and that that that's a that's a super property, right? That we've never really seen before. And um, yeah, and I like. <laughs> I think that's super powerful. All right, let's wrap this up quickly with um. There, there was four things you mentioned in your article, which I'd love you to mm -hmm. to, to explain to people. Was um, I guess four elements of uh, morality that Bitcoin, you know, in a sense reintroduces uh, mm. into society, you know, via its existence. And there were prudence, temperance justice and fortitude. So can you mm -hmm. talk to those points a little bit and, and maybe also why Bitcoin introduces these again? Yeah. Um, and the, these are, you know, the classical cardinal virtues, right? Like way, way back from, I think Aristotle it was. Uh, and, you know, the Romans, uh, you know, the, this, this was what they tried to um, make sure that they taught their children was prudence, temperance, justice, and fortitude. And, you know, you, uh, you read anything before I don't know, 1800 or so this this is a uh, part of your classical education is learning about these virtues and figuring out how to get more of it um and now prudence is uh essentially being low tide preference that's what we would call it in bitcoin it's it's planning for the future um another word that ancients used to describe that was wisdom right like it's it's just being wise about things instead of just sort of acting uh, impulsively or doing things um, that aren't in your long-term best interest. Uh, and that that's something that Bitcoin clearly does because uh, now you can store for the future. You have a lot more certainty about what's going on in the future when, you, when you're storing in Bitcoin. So that uh, is enhanced as a result of Bitcoin. Um, Temperance is doing things the right amount. And this is, uh, you know, typically like in, current usage, the word temperance is usually talked about with uh, respect to alcohol. Um, it's, uh, you know, generally thought of as just like refraining from alcohol altogether. Uh, but the ancient virtue of temperance is much more like sort of doing things the right amount, right? Uh, put, not putting things too high on your list and not putting things too low on your list. So money is a, is a great example of something that we either worship and do everything that we can to acquire or completely dismiss and treat it as if it's uh, not important at all. Um, temperance would dictate that you treat it the right with the right amount of importance, uh, not making it the goal of your life, but at the same time, not like 
uh, burning it in a fire because you know that's uh, that that you know something that you want to do. Um, it, it it's uh, it, it's sort of that medium that's the right amount to do. And Bitcoin helps with this because it doesn't make you think way too much about it like fiat money does, which uh, you need to do if you want to keep any of it. Uh, is it's a melting ice cube. You have to constantly invest. You have to learn about every investment. You have to learn about, you know, what rates you're getting on every sort of uh, thing that you have it in and what your return is and whatever. Um, so it takes your mind off it at least a little bit, um, probably a lot uh, if, if you have any significant amount of money. And it also like gives you a respect for it because it's, it's no longer, okay, it's, uh, it, it's, you know, the dollar is a tool of our oppression that's being used to oppress people all over the world through war and things like that. So um, it's it, it's a lot easier to put in the right place. I'm not saying it's easy by any means, but it's, it's a lot easier. And uh, that carries over to a lot of other things. People are addicted to shopping or sugar or video games or drugs or alcohol for that reason. It's uh, there. There's no sense of a proportionality because Keynesian mm -hmm. economics sort of makes it so that you are intemperate in everything because they they'd rather see the money velocity of money through your spending yeah. than <laughs> than any sort of temperance on your part or doing things the right amount. And civilization gets built on things being the right amount. <laughs> Uh, the yeah, third correct. one the, is the, the, the Keynesians <laughs> sort of think that like if if we if we approach things temperately in life, everything is going to stop and we're all going to die. And it's going to be a deflationary end. You know, that's it. Yeah, I, I, I guess uh, I guess the Romans didn't build Rome uh, by you know being temperate. Uh, I don't know, it's, it, which makes no sense, right? Like they Crazy. they built it over like many hundreds of years, like in a slow and steady way instead of this uh, like kind of Keynesian uh, idea that we have to do it now. All right, so um, third virtue is justice. Uh, uh, this is the idea that you, you want the right thing, like you want fair exchange and things like that. Um, you know, keeping your promises uh, is, is a part of it. It's, it's just being just, it's, it's doing the right thing. Uh, and you know, with fiat money, it's a it's a very unjust currency. <laughs> you 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 are able to take from other people. Uh, the central bank is able to take from other people and give it to whoever they want. They can pick winners and losers. Uh, so it, it brings about a civilization that is just highly unfair and unjust, and like uh, has lots of despair, wealth disparity, and uh, it's not mapped to reality like we were talking about. It's not mapped to value you've provided. It's not mapped to, uh, you know, how much ability you might have. It's just mapped to whoever happens to be in power and whatever it is that they want to do. Um, and that that is very destabilizing. Uh, and uh, whereas Bitcoin is much more aligned with natural law, it's, it's, it's about the value you've provided somebody else. Um, and it, you know, it, it's more aligned with uh, what money is supposed to be than uh, what it is currently. And finally, it's uh, fortitude. Uh, we we talked about it. Another word for that is just courage. Um, courage. Yeah. And, and the the courage that I'm talking about is the is the willingness to take risk. Um, and uh, you know the right amount of risk. Uh, you know, like I, I consider like rioting and things like that not courage at all. It's just sort of doing whatever the crowd is doing. Uh, Doing uh, what I consider courage is being an entrepreneur, <laughs> doing something mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, risk your uh, finances or whatever to create a good or service that the people in the market may or may not want and seeing if that works. Uh, that That's real courage. That's that's doing something at risk to yourself. Uh, it is not courageous when you're telling people what they want to hear. Um, I, I love uh, the... <laughs> Uh, I, I think the phrase so stunning and brave is like the most like, like biggest bastardization of courage ever because it's just saying something that everyone wants to hear. So it's not courageous at all, at least from a classical yeah. sense, it requires zero guts to do that. If it, uh, you know, the it, only in a really narcissistic mindset is that in any way brave. Uh, so you know that those all, all four of those things happen. Uh, well, courage in particular happens because there's uh, there 
you know what the rules are, right? Like it, it encourages more risk taking because you know that, you know, this yardstick is the same, um, that things aren't going to constantly change. The more uncertainty there is, the more risk averse people get. And the fact that we, uh, as a c civilization, we've gotten really, really risk averse to the point where people are locked down for like an entire year uh, tells you like how uncertain the future has been uh, for people and how little they trust in their ability to predict the future or to uh, figure out what, what it's going to bring. Uh, with something like Bitcoin, you, you have a yardstick. You know 21 million is there. If you have one Bitcoin now, it's one Bitcoin later. And, uh, and that ability uh, allows people to take more risks. And uh, like almost everything nowadays, like uh, it, it brings up the level of stability so that the, um, that the risk taking isn't as high a jump. Um, it, it, it's, uh, it's kind of like uh, being able to dunk with, you know, on a ladder or something, uh, something like that. It's a, it's a little easier to do uh, because there's this stable level that you, you can use to sort of launch off of. Uh, whereas the current situation uh, with fiat money is everything's unstable. You don't know what's going on. And uh, it's only accelerated in the past year or so. So all of that said, um, Bitcoin allows these virtues, which are really, you know, um, in, in a sense, nat a part of natural law. Th those are the mm, things that, mm. uh, that enhance uh, civil, uh, enhance like, uh, you know, uh, how we interact with cooperation and, and existence yeah 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 uh, it, it's it's part of the physics of the meta uh, you know uh, yeah. metaphysics if you will and uh and you know it will always sort of come towards that right now it's sort of unbalanced because of fiat money and we're we're seeing some of the uh, uh some of the results of that is that you get unrest and instability in, uh, all over the place um on a Bitcoin standard, you get a civilization that's a lot more closely aligned with uh, with natural law, with moral law, with uh, with doing things the right way, which ultimately end up in a bigger and better civilization, one that's thriving instead of uh, sort of disintegrating, which uh, which we've been doing for quite a while now. Yeah, Jimmy, I think that's um, that's really beautiful. Honestly, it's um, that that perspective and that idea of the reintroduction of, of morality and, and, and why Bitcoin fixes this. And this is why I sometimes get annoyed when people kind of, you know, bag out the why Bitcoin fixes this meme. Oh, sorry, not the, mm -hmm. sorry, the Bitcoin fixes this meme. Because it, it's, me and Giacomo spoke about this actually on the last episode, you know, whilst mm -hmm. these memes, they might sound trite, Mm -hmm. They, you know, and they, they might sound like, you know, throwaway lines or something, um, but mm -hmm. they actually have a lot of depth of meaning behind them because, mm -hmm. you know, when you really start to understand the, you know, the, 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 the important shifts that Bitcoin uh, has, like in, in the reintroduction of these, you know, prudence, temperance, justice, fortitude, the reintroduction of private property rights, the reintroduction of, uh, scarcity and and fixed supply money you know the, the like all of those things that bitcoin touches um you know it 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 realigns them like you said back to natural law and, and that mm. has extraordinary uh knock-on effects for mm -hmm. society so it's not you know it's not just some stupid meme that you know bitcoiners on twitter made up for the sake of you know sounding trite or sounding arrogant like it's actually got a lot of truth behind it and, and that's why i love having these conversations because we can explore really why bitcoin fixes this and why it's such an important innovation um and and i hope that people listening to this like really got a lot of value out of that because um yeah B B bitcoin embodies morality and in doing so reintroduces morality um you know a, a north star if we're going to use mm -hmm. that um Mm -hmm. that were from our last conversation yeah. yeah from the last conversation exactly and um yeah, yeah I, I just I, think I, that's yeah and i i think what you're saying is right there um memes to me are a form of rhetoric um and there's uh there's the dialectic and the rhetoric 
um, the, the easy way, because memes tend to be kind of funny or um, easy to say or whatever, there, there's a tendency to dismiss rhetoric, uh, memes as just rhetoric, but there's a, there's mm -hmm. a significant dialectic behind it. And, uh, and that, that's something that I really appreciate because uh, the, the strongest memes have a very strong dialectic behind it. Uh, and even, even something as tried as half fun staying poor, there's a mm, real mm. depth to that. Uh, that the, yeah. uh, there's a dialectic to that. That if you really understood, you'd be like, "Oh, okay, that that makes sense." Um, I mean, it's it's warning people. We want you to come to our camp, um, and you know, here's Noah's Ark. But if you don't want to get on, you know, I mean, have fun staying poor, right? Like, yeah. like what can we do? We we've done all we can to warn you of what's coming. Um, you know that that's a that uh, sort of thing is. Uh, not obvious to people because they uh, they want to dismiss the rhetoric without looking at the dialectic that's behind it. Um, and for me, um, you know, like conversations like this are much more about the dialectic. Uh, but the rhetoric draws people in. It it, it shows them oh, okay, it's it's sort of short circuiting uh, their assumptions a little bit because it is very effective and powerful. And they go okay, why why is that the case? What what what's uh, what what's under this rhetoric that that's sort of short circuiting my brain a little bit and um, triggering me or whatever you know may, is there is there something behind it or whatever and it's kind of like that you know um what what's it, it it's like a like a needle in your mind or something that's the line from mm -hmm. the matrix mm -hmm. right like it, it it's mm -hmm. it that that's that's the purpose of a meme it's it's to yeah yeah it, it's to get them it, it's it's that annoying thing in their mind that they they you know yeah you, you have to extract it or yeah you, you have to look into it or something is to get them to actually get into that level where they can actually explore this for real yeah and um I hope, I hope that people listening to this, uh, that this inspires them to keep digging. I mean, you know, do, doing these podcasts, even though they're, they're as broad as possible and, and generally quite long considering, you know, what most podcasts are these days, but it's like, you know, th this is, this is a journey. Uh, and I think to, to wrap this up, I mean, Jimmy's done some incredible work, uh, the new book, thank God for Bitcoin, right? Am I phrasing yeah, that right? Thank God for Bitcoin. <laughs> there you there go. There it is. So, so that's one resource. Um, the little Bitcoin book. Uh, what was the was a programming Bitcoin that you did? Yeah, yeah. That that's yeah. a programmer's book. It doesn't yeah, have cool. quite the dialectic or rhetoric um, <laughs> even in there. Maybe maybe a different form of dialectic, right? Uh, oh, sure, um, sure. Yeah. So, so, so there's that, there's uh, the, you know, Jimmy's done a series of brilliant, brilliant articles on, um, on medium. So Jimmy, what's the, what's your medium uh, handle again? Is it just Jimmy song? Dot it is just Jimmy or? song. And uh, I, I haven't uh, written to it lately, although um, I do want to write about like this idea that centralization like models property rights and that mm. uh, it creates sort of uncertainty and it's bad for that reason. Um, and this is why you should Bitcoin because it's decentralized and why, uh, and I mean, all coins suffer from sort of that muddled um, property yeah. right thing too, because yeah, I mean, they hard fork and it's like, oh, okay, I guess I don't really own it. Or, you know, like they, it, 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 it gets, it's, you don't really own it. All coins is essentially what I want to say in that article. Yeah. <laughs> shit coinery for me is like the the peak arrogance and ignorance of like what's happening in society today it's like let's take the bitcoin narrative but then let's do exactly what the central planners and governments are doing today but we'll just do it ourselves it's like it is i literally i call it digital fiat that's all it is it's yeah like there's, yeah. there's there's it's just a it's just a more fragile uh mm -hmm. uh corrupt digital fiat mm -hmm. run by nerds who um mm -hmm. who have you know well, they're technocrats no other... right <laughs> yeah technocrats that's it yeah exactly yeah, yeah. um yeah. you know i would almost argue that the traditional fiat system has probably got better checks and balances than you know crypto because mm -hmm. 
at least there's some um, there's some wetware in between, right? To to sort of you know slow things down and to to to, to bring some temperance. Whereas uh, in in crypto in in Ethereum, it's like let's um yeah let's let's create a technocratic utopia based on what Vitalik believes is ethical. Um, mm. Great idea. Yeah, let's. Uh, that's exactly <laughs> what we should be doing. <laughs> Yeah, so I I want I want to write an article like that. Uh, we'll 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 see if uh, see if it comes out at some point. But yeah, I, I I haven't written to it as much in the past year. I do want to change that at least a little bit this year. So we'll we'll see. Um, but yeah, at, at Jimmy Song is my medium. Sweet, sweet. So at Jimmy Song there, at Jimmy Song on Twitter. Um, is there anything else you want to like some final thoughts, man? Before we wrap this up. Um, I mean, uh, the, I, mean, I, I want to show my book, basically, it's, yeah, the, this is the moral argument uh, for Bitcoin from a Christian perspective, we, I, we do touch a lot on natural rights, for example, and, uh, and a lot of the book is, uh, is actually arguing from that perspective. So if you believe, for example, that theft is wrong, that if you actually believe in property rights, in other words, um, I think most of the arguments in the book are are going to hold for you because it's 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 straight up okay theft is wrong these are theft and therefore uh, you know fiat is wrong and Bitcoin is superior because it's harder to steal um, and it's uh, it, it doesn't have like a trusted third party that can do things to your property that you otherwise uh, should be able to. So it maps to natural law better. It maps to property rights better. It's, uh, it, it's superior in, uh, in many ways, what we call the redemption of money, uh, uh, taking it from what it, uh, what it should be. Uh, well, Fiat has taken it from what it should be to sort of like a Nietzschean sort of power play thingy uh you know bitcoin takes it from this nietzschean power play thingy to what money should be again so that's the redemption of money so that um hopefully you can uh go read the book even if you're not a christian um i think you would get a lot out of it a lot of our conversation here today was uh you know uh inspired at least by by it if not uh straight up in the book itself so there we go I, I can I can vouch for it. I um I did have a read of it, and um mm -hmm. and I'm I'm only halfway through because I've been dealing with banks yeah. back in Australia. Uh -huh. But it's um it I I as someone who I guess as we established in the last conversation, I think you know we align so well. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. although I might not label myself as a Christian, I think this book is like one of the one one of the better Bitcoin books uh, I've mm -hmm. read. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it's, it's, it's interesting, all of the Bitcoin content, like in all of the books that I've read are really, really good. And this one, mm -hmm. this one's right up there. So, you know, that's my, uh, my personal endorsement for it. I think everyone should. Thank you. It. Thank you. Hopefully that that's something that you can take and maybe go read the book. Uh, and yeah, I will, we'll have the audio book out pretty soon, hopefully. So, um, you know, that's your mode of learning that might be available, uh, for a lot of podcast listeners that tends to be the case so you know stay tuned it's coming brilliant all right jimmy dude thank you again for the catch-up really appreciate it um, we always have great conversations and um and yeah hopefully in a couple months we'll do round two of the uh the bitcoin preachers but um <laughs> let's, uh, let's see let's let's hope they haven't fucking bombed texas by then <laughs> or fucking yeah, yeah. Just, let's uh let's hope knows? a nuclear bomb doesn't drop on texas uh because i'm here so yeah but happy uh, happy to always uh be on your podcast and uh you know hang out and just talk about stuff uh you always bring some interesting questions so really appreciate it and yeah let's do it again brilliant all right jimmy thanks buddy Come on!